Welcome to the HDG Stories Podcast, where we'll share our threads of memories, knowledge, experience, and history, knitting all generations into a beautiful tapestry. So please like and share, and be sure to subscribe. Now let's get started. Hi, this is Ellie. This is an exciting podcast for me because I get to interview my favorite mayor of Half of the Grace, Mayor Phil, Phil Barker. He shares an interesting life of growing up poor yet very happy in Salisbury, Maryland, and the journey from doffing at the E.I. DuPont nylon factory in Seaford, Delaware, following high school, to learning Russian for the U.S. Army Security Agency, going to college on the G.I. Bill, and marrying a Habit of Grace girl and working 31 years for Uber Corporation. This is a wonderful excerpt from his full-length interview. Welcome, Mayor Phil. Before we go any further, yes. I have to take you back to your earliest memories, starting like when you were born and where you were born. I was born in Salisbury, Maryland, September the 24th, 1934. We, we, I, I remember we lived in a house on West Isabella Street. Remember that? And I was, in fact, my brother and I just the other day, we were talking about it. And I got pictures at home of us. He and I, when we were just kids, and when I was a baby, my mother always told me I was chubby. I weighed ten and a half pounds when I was born. Healthy boy. Yes. <laughs> and she, and you know, and she, after a year and a half or two years or whatever it was, I'm playing with a girl, a little girl next door, and she had the whooping cough. And my mother said, "You got the whooping cough, and lost all your weight." And so there, you've been skinny ever since. <laughs> that's what she used to tell me years ago. <laughs> and I assume that that's true, I guess. Cause I turned out to be tall and skinny, not fat, yeah. chubby. But I was when I was born, you know, 10 and a half pounds. Quite a good, good size. Baby. Yeah, it's a good yep. size. And your and, brother is older than you. Your brother well, is. Yeah, he's 86. Yeah. 86 just on the 5th, December 5th. Okay. Yeah, and we celebrate his birthday. And uh, well, What are some of your earliest memories? One of them pops in my mind for some in, in in my day of being a youngster on the west side of town of Salisbury, uh, had lots of children or lots of kids lived in the neighborhood, not like it is today. And we all played together. We, we played football in somebody's yard, you know, and crazy things we we did. Uh, we 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 had woods all around us in one area, and and we used to be aggressive enough that we would go and find vines we call them monkey mm -hmm. uh, but uh in the trees and cut them down in a certain way so you could go from this tree to that just like tarzan used swing. to do and we would build uh platforms just kids you know you uh, we you know of course we didn't have computers didn't have iphones and all that stuff televisions and yeah television didn't have television and so we played together all the time just played together went to school together we were ambitious children we all had bicycles, and we'd all go to the uh, store there in town that sold old army equipment. And every every one of us had a canteen, <laughs> and and we and we would buy a port. We bought a portable little stove, and we'd take off and ride out into the country on our bicycles and camp out, and just as small kids, parents in the, like in those grade days, school? huh? Great school, yeah, 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 and. And we in the in one area of the schools where they they dug where they dug all the sand you know and created large holes in the ground they filled up with rainwater and we would we would go skinny dipping in those old ponds we ice skated constantly because in those, my days of, of being young it was colder weather it had to have been because we had ice in Salisbury on the ponds I mean you know during the winter and uh, we all ice skated. Every kid ice skated. You fall in the water, you come out. You know, okay, we just never had any problem. It seems like mm. that manifest themselves today, and everybody walks around now with a thing in their face, you know, no communication. But we had we had a we were poor, most most all of us were sort of on the poor side. We had a lot of fun. We really enjoyed children's activities. And um, now is this just boys or boys and girls? Well, there was one girl. <laughs> she was a tomboy, we call sure. her. And uh, uh, but then you know, she was just like a boy too. Yeah. I mean, we all we all you played together. All we played together. cops and robbers and the cowboys and Indians and all that stuff. 
And my brother and I used to go to the movies. My mother would give us a quarter, and we we, we both were ushers in movies later on, just to make a couple of bucks. But we'd go to movies as y- real young kids. My family never had a car. We had to borrow my grandfather's car. We would get down there, and we would walk home to a couple of miles home at night, and no one bothered us. We just walked home. But we used to go. Nickel, I think, to get into the movie, to, watch, to see the movie. and fr- Every Friday night, there was always cowboy movie. And, you know, and so we always went to the cowboy. And then you had 20 cents left over to buy a candy bar and a bag of popcorn. And that's all you needed. And then, you know, time passes. And, and I'm in high school, my senior year, I worked at Boulevard Theater in, Havity, in, in Salisbury just so I could have, have some money to... Money to uh, go to the prom, you know, mm-hmm. and run a tuxedo and buy a ring and all now, that stuff. what did your parents do that, I mean, how did they work if you didn't have a car? We just um, walked or, or uh, we, we had to ride with someone else. Uh, when Levin graduated from high school, he went to work, uh, he didn't go to college, and he went to work for a printer, printed newspaper. Small, it was a small, small business. And he made a little bit of money, and that's when we first got our first television. He bought it. That's your brother? Yeah. And uh, and then later on, he bought this old 41, 1941 Dodge, huge old car. <laughs> but it was it was a car, man, and traveled. You know? Yeah. Now, I'm, yeah, I don't mean to bleed on you, but, no, but, no. but it, the, when I was a senior in high school, you know, I wanted to try, try to do these things and have a reasonably reasonable senior year like the rest of the kids and so i went to work at the boulevard theater now the high school is here let's say the boulevard theater is here and my house is here and there's two miles so i'd walk from home to school and then i'd walk back home after school and then i'd walk back a mile and a half to the theater and walk back a mile and a half at 10 30 11 o'clock at night after i got off the theater wow. did that for a year and no, no worse for the wear and then he got this car, and then he went in the Air Force. And Did so he, the he left the car. He said, <laughs> he said, he said, Mom, you can have to use the car and fill. And so I went and got my driver's license. Never driven a car in my life. When I went to get my driver's and I borrowed a car from a cousin, and uh, it was, a, and I borrowed that particular car because it was a small car at that time. It was only a two-seater, you know, it was wow. like this little thing. Never, never driven a car before in my life. Took the, the written test and all that stuff because I studied for that and I passed that. He said, let's go for a ride. You know, now this is stick shifts yeah. and all this stuff. I thought, I don't even know, <laughs> don't even know how to do this. <laughs> and, and in those days, you had to give signals. You know, if you're turning right, turning left yes. and all that stuff, you have to remember to do that. And once around the block, the old armory in Salisbury and, and this guy, he said, pull over, pull over to the curb. He said, he looked at me, he said, you know, you're not doing so well. I remember him saying that. And uh, my father was with me. And when we pulled over, my father was standing there because we pulled over right where he was at. And this guy knew him. They knew each other. So he got out of the car and began talking to my father. And they were having a nice conversation. I'm just sitting in the car. And he finally said, okay, let's go. Drive on up, go around the corner. Turn left up here, and you give me instructions. So I was doing those things, and, and then parked the car. And I parked the car somehow. I was up on the curb twice, and, and luckily he wasn't looking at me because I went back right up on the curb. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. And, and uh, at that time, you, we went into the armory, and he said, "Okay, you got it. I'll be done. Got my license. I, don't know, I forgot exactly how that stamped something. You know, boom, you got your license. Go, go drive." So after that happened, then you had to go figure out how to drive this big old car. I had, yeah, and and I learned because every so often, then instead of walking all of this distance, I I was uh, able to drive his old car to the theater and back at night. Not all the time, but it was a, it was a matter of means of understanding the car. It burned oil like crazy, and I learned that, and so. Before I would drive it in the distance, I'd have to, and and in that old car, you had to lift up the floorboard, and the and the oil depository was under that floorboard. 
What in the in the engine? So in front of you, in the seat. It was underneath your feet. How we do it? Yeah, and I had so so I do that, and I and I'd buy oil and <laughs> fill it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, you do all those crazy things as a kid, uh, as a young young youngster, and uh, I don't know. Children today, I think, are way ahead of way ahead of us then, as far as mechanics or you know driving a vehicle and car and all that stuff because they got them. Everybody's got them. Yeah. It, it was quite an experience. Um, my transportation was feet and legs. Any activities in school or sports or anything like that that you recall? That yeah, was yeah. I, 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 uh, even I pat myself on the back. I was a good baseball player. I didn't play. I, I played intramural football basketball but I didn't play on the, the, the school team but I played baseball in school my junior and senior years after I after I went to work DuPont I was working ship work only at 17 when I got out of high school okay. I started school when I was, I was 17 and I went to work and I'm working ship work I wanted to play baseball and so I, I, I there's a team down the eastern shore called the by county league and it was made up teams of various towns. And so the Pittsville, I don't know if you've heard of Pittsville or not, it's on the way to Ocean City on the old Route 50. Got to know someone there, and he said, would you want to play baseball on the Pittsville team, not the Stallbury team? I was, yeah, love it. And so I signed the contract to play uh, by county league, and I did. But the only trouble was that I was working at DuPont. I'm working every day for shift work. So some weeks, we played all the games on Sunday. Some weeks I'm playing. I'm I'm working four to twelve. Some weeks I'm work. I'm working graveyard. You know, eleven or twelve to eight. Holy oh, shit! And I was a pitcher, and I was pretty good. And, uh, <laughs> and I remember I, I, right now. I'm remembering the game. It was a close game, and uh, I hit the umpire with the baseball. Catcher missed it. I'm not. I mean, he, yeah. he just missed it and it hit him. Aggravated. He, and from then on, it was a tough, tough game. <laughs> Well, had to, every strike has to be a strike, <laughs> and uh, but you know, here it comes. Uh, uh, no, Seaford, Delaware was twenty miles from Salisbury. Got to get to work four o'clock. We started the game at one, so I'm pitching as long as I possibly can until about three, and then I say, "Well, I got to go to work." Oh <laughs> and the coach said, "Okay, you know, you got to go work. You got to go work." And, uh, and they worked. They worked around. Worked around yeah, so they had relief. Picture come in and I go out and get in my car, and change my clothes, and take off for sixty dollars. Did that that whole summer, but I enjoyed. I enjoyed. Loved baseball. And I enlisted, but I got out of high school. Had no thought of going to college, so I went to work and I, I, I got a job. EI Dupont De New Mars Company in Dupont mm -hmm. in uh, Seaford, Delaware. And they made nylon. Korean War. I graduated high school in fifty two. The Korean War was really Full, full speed ahead there, winding down pretty much uh, during that period of time. Uh, DuPont uh, came to our high school and, and interviewed students who weren't going to college. So they hired me. When I graduated, next week I'm working at, in their factory in Seaford, Delaware, an island factory, and I was a custodian. My entry level job was sweep the floors, keep the place clean. It was machinery, just constantly yeah. just spitting out oil. You know, it was, so I stayed there for a year and a half and worked my way up to a Group 1 to Group 6 job. And I'm now I'm running the machine, as we call it, dolphing, <laughs> the yarn from the machine, you know, okay. as it was getting made. And, uh, and then my foreman came to me and said, uh, you know, Bill, this is, they're going to be cutting back. Now, the war is starting to stop. They don't need much nylon yeah. for everything and all this. And so he said, I think you're going to get laid off in a couple of months. So I said, okay. It was still wartime, and uh, by all government standards, I decided, well, I'm going to be drafted one time or another, I'm sure. So I said, might as well. And they said, well, if you go in the military, if you go in the Army or wherever, well, your job is secure. You can come back to it. And so I enlisted in the Army and hmm. took tests, competitive tests, and I qualified. So do that while you were still there, and then they'd save your job. They saved, me, saved my job. So I went in the Army. and. Took a lot of tests, and I qualified for the Army Language School in California. And that's when I studied Russian for a year, and then went overseas and did my job. Had you taken language in high school? No. 
No, I've never, never had a language. No, I've never had it. Never even thought about it. No, because I just, I was a good student. I, yeah. was, I was on the honor roll all the time. And when I was in college, I was on the dean's list after the army. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, I just happened to pass a crazy test. And, I, and again, it related English, English language, grammar. You applied all your knowledge. Anyway, I passed the test. You qualified to go to the language school. They asked what language did you want? And I said Japanese. Because my brother was in Korea over okay. there then yeah. at that time. He was in Japan and he was in the medical force of the Air Force. Passed test and they said, Well, you qualify for this school and that school. And uh, so I went to uh, Fort Devens, Massachusetts first because I was going to be in their Morse Code school. And when I got there, casual company for gosh, a couple of months, just waiting to go to school, waiting for my class to start. And I'm now custodian there as a casual soldier, not nothing to do. Right. I, I took care of the bathrooms, latrines as we call them. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, boy, I don't want to do this. I, I said, I'm, I'm there with these people. And so then they, they gave me this other test, and, and I passed it to the Army Language School in California. So after a period of time, they got enough soldiers together, brought an airplane in, military aircraft, Boston, and they flew us to Monterey, California. Took thirty six hours to fly across. Well, <laughs> it, it was it was storms yeah. the whole way across, and this propeller driven yeah. thing, I think, it was on its last leg, and it landed. Let we landed eleven times just to get across the country. And what what year would this have been? That was nineteen fifty four. The uh, armistice and everything was signed shortly, uh, sometime after that. But when I got out of the army, I went back to work, and I decided, well, I got the GI Bill, and uh, just don't want to work in this plant the rest of my life. Yeah, I mean, it, this it, isn't a forever thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I quit and, and went to Salisbury State Teachers College, as it was then. Yeah. And it was many years ago. Walked in and said, I'd like to go to school. Fine. Sign here. Just that easy. The cost of going to school there was very nominal. The, uh, I had GI Bill and I was getting and, $115 a month going to school under the GI Bill. And that's what brought me to have a degree. Because I'm, my freshman year, there's, a, there's a, several people from have degrees who were going to school there, going to college there. Now, I'm, I'm older than the rest of them. Met, you know, my first wife at college, at Salisbury State Teachers College, our freshman year. And we fell in love and all that stuff. Decided to get married. During the summer, between freshman and sophomore, and we did. Mm -hmm. went, went through our sophomore year, and then I transferred to the University of Maryland in my junior year because that's the program I was in. Mm -hmm. So when we went there, that's where my son Kevin was born. We lived in one in an army barrack. In those days, they had a you're familiar with college park. They got Fraternity Row, and behind them were army barracks, old army barracks put up there for veterans. Cheap, you know, and uh, and so I got got a place there, which was, uh, I guess, about as big as this part here. <laughs> this is what we lived in, and it had a little bathroom, and you know, and everybody else, in, in, there are about six or seven army guards. So everybody, we're all living, you know, hand to mouth, trying to get your education. And the guy oh, over his little apartment above us, uh, two floors. He was getting his Ph.D., and we became good friends. Still are today. He lives in Virginia, lives in Williamsburg. And I began going with him over to, because over to, he was uh, getting his Ph.D. So he taught a class in mm -hmm. biology. So he had an office to get to study, you know, because Kevin was sick as a baby. So I used to go with him every night to, to the college. We'd go over there. We'd walk over there, study for two or three hours, and get my work done, and we'd come back to our little place that we slept on a hide bed because it didn't have any room for a bed and so we we survived that for two years of course my wife at that time dropped out of college mm -hmm. and, uh, what was her name though juanita it was juanita gordy and and uh, her parents lived on on not Seagull street the house is still there well, her last name then was yeah. gordy when i became mayor when i was i i, I retired from huber this is my job and I, I loved it. It, it was fun. It's the best job there is. I was very content in doing the job of the mayor. Year 2000. 
That's when I went to Estonia. I mean, that was one of the things, being mayor, allowed me to do that. And, and it was such a, an, an honor, an interesting and exciting trip to go over there and represent Have It A Grace. And, and these guys over here, they all came to Have It A Grace. Plus other mayors. I met every mayor of every town over there when I was there. That was my Do job. Do we still interact with them? Uh, yeah. I, cause I, well, because I created a sister city. That's what I thought. Silima. And Silima, Mastery went we'll over. Talk about that. We then began supporting the, the Methodist Church in, in Silima. Now, this guy here, their mayor, and I got together during this little visit. What attracted me to this was that the Maryland National Guard. Now, this is a colonel in the Maryland National Guard. He was my driver and whatever over there. The Maryland National Guard had a attache there, and this guy was that at one time. The Maryland National Guard in Silom, in Estonia. Now, Estonia, in this particular time I went, they just were celebrating their 10th anniversary of being free of the Soviet Union. So it was a big celebration time. Now, what made you pick Estonia? They picked the National Guard picked it because they have they were celebrating the 10th anniversary of being free of the Soviet Union, the Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia. And so they, they wanted to celebrate. So the, the general of the National Guard, he and I were good friends. So he called me, and he, he and I were friends. We had been together at some events at the Proving Ground particularly the years that I was the uh, county council person in the proving ground part of my district. He called me one day in the office and he said, Phil, he said, we're going to do this celebration. The Maryland National Guard's involved and I'd like for you to represent represent us in the city of Hungary's obviously, uh, and go into Estonia for this celebration. So he said, I'll send the colonel. He'll come pick you up, drive you to the airport, go with you, drive you while you're over there. For a month, I mean, for a week or two weeks, visit all of the communities and uh, find out what's going on and represent the Maryland National Guard. And I said, fine. So I went, they drove me to Andrews Air Force Base and one morning early and had a meeting with some of the people in charge of everything. Got over there and Estonia it was a backward country because the Soviet Union had been for years and years and years and years. Silama, when I finally got to them towards the end of the trip, when when I was there for this, you could see the Silama was built by the Russians. And you could see the architecture influence. You could see some of these old buildings, big concrete cinder block buildings where they just crammed like they do. They cram people in there. You know, fam like a family of four lives in here. You know, that sort of thing. And then when they finally, when, when whatever worldly thing happened, they caused it all to end. Uh, they just moved. They just moved everything out. But the reason they created and built Silama was to create or develop uranium for atomic energy. Because it's right on the water. And most people they brought in there were all working there, and so many of them were cancer. I mean, it was just it was just a mess. And, and the city was just you know they had they had a nice big building there with arts building, and it was just a Shamble. Anyway, so they spoke Russian and so on. Now, in, in Estonia, they generally spoke Estonian, their own language. A lot of Russian. Now, I knew Russian, so I don't know if I had any. You influence. remember it even then? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I mean, not. When I graduated from the Army Language School, I was fluent. Yeah. And I could read and write and, and dream <laughs> in Russian. Now, this is years and years and years, years later, obviously, and I didn't know as much. But I understood, but, and I could yeah. still, the mayor and I, one, one day, we just, he just said, let's go for a walk. We, and we, just, we just walked around, and he's talking to me in broken English, and I'm talking to him in broken <laughs> <Yeah>. English. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Russia and Estonia were bumped, bumped together there by a body of water that separated, a big bridge. We tried to get across, but they wouldn't let me they didn't have a visa. I couldn't go into, I wanted to go into they the Soviet Union. You because when I graduated from the Army Language School, there are newspapers in Russia, as little guy, you know, guy as I was, the, uh, they were called the Krokodil, the Zvestia, and the Journal. Newspapers of the Soviet Union had my picture and name, rank, and serial number that another 
uh, Amerikansky spion. Spy? Yeah, American Russian spy? Sp Russian sp I mean, oh. American spy. And, and, they, and, they, and they... So you might not have got back if you'd have got on the other yeah, side. Yeah, well, <laughs> when, I, when I graduated from school, it was very clear and un we could never, would never go to the Soviet Union. They wouldn't allow us in because they know who we are and they figure that we're the wow. spy. Crazy how a little old thing, you, you know, would think you this were little guy is not known by anybody. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, he's making the newspapers in the Soviet Union, along with the rest of my grad yeah. my classmates that graduated. We all, all of our names appeared, so they knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know. And when we got over there, the work that we did, they knew we were doing it. They just didn't know how successful we were. So, so it, it was an interesting trip. Now, this, this young lady, it was a middle school, and this young lady came over and asked me to dance. They had a party because the vice president, of Estonia and I presented the school or accepted the school for Estonia. So I took gifts and you can see I'm dancing with her and I have one of them in my hand. And it's a picture of Happy Grace. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. oh, cool. And and I also took over a, a big banner of the uh, Baltimore Orioles because I found out that they had a big they had a class in in the, in the school toured there's one class they took me into and the teacher spoke only English, teaching English. Uh -huh. And they had a big, big thing sign in there, you know, for Yankee. Okay. <laughs> uh, it was quite a trip. Uh, it, it, was, it was so interesting. Now, it, I'm curious in that scenario, what kind of conversations do you have? Well, we, we, were, we were wanting to know, basically, uh, we were trying to teach them or show them or or illustrate to them American life in a small community such as we. And I'm trying to learn what they were doing and how they were doing it, the politics of the area and how they were, how they handled that. Some of these councils, huge, tons of people in these councils, not, not little six-membered thing that we've got okay. here. It, it was basically to uh, show friendship and, uh -huh. and uh, concern that, that we are, and uh, particularly when you get to Siloma, the mayor there and I wanting to join together so our, our cities would be sister cities, as they called them. So we would be uh, interested in, in, in what's happening to them and what's happening to us. So it's a matter of exchanging ideas and thoughts in, in the local government. Plus, we, we got to see all the historical things. Mm -hmm. you know, we were taken to churches and other places in Estonia that were historical in nature. Now, when you were here, you didn't come when the racetrack was still going. No. Well, I, I have memories of, of out there because uh -huh. when I got here, the racing had stopped, but the uh, National Guard was out there and still is. Organizations then used their main uh, grandstand area there, which was enclosed but for all of the big parties because there was nothing else here in Havre. There was no big build, a building that you could have, like the Elks Lodge, for example. They would have their big charity ball out there every year. And it used to be big time. It used to be, you know, two bands playing, you know, and music never stopped. And hundreds of people would go out there all dressed up in tuxedos and gowns, etc. Thanks, Mayor Phil. This was really fun. This interview was an excerpt from Phil's full-length interview. Visit our website at hdgstories.com for other podcasts to join our mail list and maybe consider our paid membership. Till our next podcast, have a great week. We hope you've enjoyed today's HDG Stories podcast. We encourage you to subscribe. We hope you will share with your friends. Till the next story, we invite you to visit us at hdgstories.com.